the Good Chris Sophian Talks podcast. I'm Levi. And I'm Chris. Thank you so much for joining us this week. On this podcast, we select one talk a week to help each one of us get the Bible in our daily news feed. We post at the start of each week for you to listen with a short intro beforehand to kind of set the stage for the talk you're about to hear. And now, let's hear more about this week's talk. This class today is by Brother Joe Miles uh, from England, and the title is Are You Being Groomed? Uh, this is a very, very interesting class uh, where he, where Joe goes kind of deep into um, how often uh, in pop culture and in advertising, uh, we are kind of encouraged to be aware of our physical appearance and to judge others. Um, he's, he says that right off the top, you're judging me just by looking at what I'm, what I'm wearing, which I thought was an interesting point. Um, he goes into that and then compares that to uh, our Lord Jesus and how uh, how he lived and how he thought. Um, I really enjoyed this class. It is definitely um, different in that I don't I don't know the year or when this is. It sounds like a much younger Joe Miles, but it may be just a bad recording. This is from Chris Delphian Vault, um, which doesn't give a lot of information on when the talk uh, was published. Um, this talk definitely stands up on its own. Um, and it's it, I think it's a Young People's Weekend and it clearly has slides in England um, somewhere so again i i got a lot out of this talk and it was a different again a different kind of style um uh, one thing i noticed is he refers to scripture basically constantly through the talk but rarely actually quotes the passage which i thought was interesting so again worked well for a podcast easy to um uh, to listen to and i think it's worth uh, worth sharing here so are you being groomed by joe miles <laughs> Hey, good morning, everyone. It's lovely. Good. Morning. good. Morning. You all right? Yeah. It's good. It's like an audience with Joe Miles, isn't it? Hey, I'm fine. That's good. Um, I just say uh, I don't like computers, so if it doesn't work, it's not my fault. It's cursed. Yes. Did you put the thing around your neck? The thing, the garroting tool. If I go, if I get boring, this gets tighter and tighter. <laughs> right. Let's see. Start. Ah, there we go. Cover it up. Um, it's nice to be back here at Shirley as well. Shirley is where I spent a lot of my formative years. I was in baptised somewhere under there. A lot of happy memories. Um, in fact, I was thinking on the way, I drove up from London where I live this morning. It's a good job this is at Shirley. If it had been at Hawley, it would have been Hawley Holy Holy Day. So, you know. <laughs> Maybe the next one. I don't know. Anyway, it's lovely to see you all. But I've just got one question, or one request. Will you please stop judging me? I don't know if you know you're doing it. Well, I don't know if you know that you've already done it. But you are, you're judging me. You already have done, because we all do it naturally. For example, what am I wearing? What am I wearing? <laughs> Look, blue trainers, stripy socks. Funny grey trousers, what's this top? And jacket. And you've made judgments about me from what you've seen me wearing. And your hair. And my hair, because I look hard. Have you seen the scar? I've got a great big scar there, one there and one there as well. I look very hard. I don't get mugged anymore. But, um, but you are making judgments about me. And the thing is, I can actually alter your view of me. You see, if I told you, I actually made this top myself, which is why the stripes don't go all the way round, and they're starting to disappear. And now you're thinking, oh, he makes his own clothes, and you'll put a different slant on how you see me. Or am I lying? Is this top actually from Burberry, one of the top British designers? Well, uh, design houses. And now you'll see me slightly different again. Is this a Prada jacket, or is it from a cancer research shop on fin Finchley Road that I bought on May the 13th? 1993. <laughs> Each time I tell you one of these things, you're changing your view of me. You're seeing me slightly differently, whether you know it or not. And appearance these days is everything, they tell us. Appearance is everything. It's so important. So what did Christ look like? I've got, you can look the readings up, you can just write them down, or hopefully, fingers crossed, whee! I've got them all up here. Isaiah 53, verse 2. What did he look like? Okay, we don't know what type of hair he had or what his nose or his ears or his face was like, but we know this. 
Isaiah 53, verse 2, he, that is Christ, grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. I find that sometimes that verse really makes me want to cry because it is, it's so humbling, isn't it? The son of the almighty God, the son of the creator of heaven and earth, the son of the omnipotent, omnipresent, omniscient being who created you and me, his son looked average. Jesus looked normal. And yet he was the son of God. And if he was here, if he came in and sat down, you wouldn't notice him. Because he's just another face. Nothing special about his face, about his appearance. I think if he started talking, you'd probably notice him then. But otherwise, he would just be another person. <coughs> I know some people find that hard to accept. Whenever you see films about Jesus, he's always very good looking. And in books, he's drawn very beautifully. You know, he often has blue eyes. I don't know why that is. But he's always, he's always very good looking. And conversely, Judas, I don't know, when I, when I had my kids' books, and, and Jesus was very good looking. And it was always obvious that Judas was the one who was going to betray him. Because all the disciples would be gathered around Jesus. And Judas would be in the corner going. <laughs> like that. Because we caricature. We, well, that's appearance. Judas must have looked like that. Because he was the evil one, if you like. Jesus was the pure, the good one. So he must have been beautiful. No. He looked normal. And the fact that he looked normal made his message so much more important. You see, for example, when, um, when Saul became king, people were attracted to Saul. He was seven foot, maybe, a head taller than any other man. He didn't have a blemish on his body. He was a beautiful man, and people loved him because of his appearance. When Christ came, people loved him and were drawn to him, not by his appearance, but by what he said by what he did, by what he offered them. That's what made him so special. Even when he came from here. John 1, 45, 46. Philip found Nathaniel and told him, we have found the one Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote. Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nazareth? Can anything good come from Nazareth? Nathaniel asked. Come and see, said Philip. Even where he came from, Nazareth, Nazareth, that'd be like someone coming in here saying, we found the Messiah, he's, he's from Dudley, or something, I don't know. I'm trying to, trying to think what the equivalent is. Is there anyone here from Dudley? Whew, that's a relief. <laughs> but you know, we have jokes about certain places. In London, they joke about Birmingham, and I have to keep very quiet. But we have jokes about a certain place. Nazareth was one, Nazareth? Even where he came from was, if you like, as the world, society, whatever you want to call it, whatever word you want to use, as the world or society sees it, he came from the wrong place. Surely he should come from Jerusalem or somewhere like that. But Christ proved it didn't matter what you look like. It's what's inside that counts. And if you're, on the, if you're right inside... And that's bound to come out. And that came out in Christ. That's why people were drawn to him. That's why little children, I have two little children, which is why I'm so tired all the time. And uh, I shave my head in mourning for my lost youth. <laughs> but my little children, bless them, um, the, little children are very good judges of character. And they don't automatically go to people who are good looking. But they do feel immediately comfortable with someone who they know is a fun person to be with, a nice person to be with, happy, gentle, playful. And little children went to Christ because all those things inside him came out of him. Yeah, this one. No, shh. He's talking about it. Sit down, quick. Shh. You all right? The little children were drawn to Christ. What was inside them came out. Now, oh, have I got that? I've got to see if I've got a little book with me. I just realised. Oh, 
I love Roald Dahl. I started reading all my Roald Dahl books again. It's terribly sad. Then one read The Twit by Roald Dahl. Yes. I like the way you don't really want to admit it, so you just go, yes. Right. Roald Dahl wrote something very, very, very good about what's on the inside coming what's on the outside. Right. In fact, let's look. It says, let's put them up. There you go. I used to go out with a girl like that. Um, it says, if a person has ugly thoughts, it begins to show on the face. And when that person has ugly thoughts every day, every week, every year, the face gets uglier and uglier until it gets so ugly you can hardly bear to look at it. Because what's on the inside will inevitably come out. Now, the next picture I love because I know people like this and it, I think about it, it makes me smile think about them a person who has good thoughts cannot ever be ugly <laughs> but it's, you see you feel happy looking isn't she great a person who has good thoughts cannot ever be ugly you can have a wonky nose and a crooked mouth and a double chin and stick out teeth but if you have good thoughts they will shine out of your face like sunbeams and you will always look lovely So what's on the inside that counts? Okay, that's a drawing, that's a cartoon. But it's true, because we see that and we actually know people like that. Well, <laughs> kind of like that, you know. I didn't go out with a girl like that. Right, it's what's on the inside that counts. Now, here we go. You probably, you may have thought of this verse already. Of course, this is when Samuel turned up to choose a king to follow on from Saul, and he went through the sons of Jesse. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things man looks at. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. So um, you, you may well have thought of that already in terms of appearance. Right, so here's a question. I want you to put your hands up if you think appearance really isn't that important. Put your hands up if you think appearance isn't that important. Okay, so you say shouldn't be that important. Oh, yeah. Cool, you're good, aren't you? Look at that. Right, hey, put your hands up again. Keep your hands up if you think appearance shouldn't be that important. Quite a lot of you. Nearly all. Okay. What's this? That's not for you. What's that? You're not sure? Okay. Um, put your hands up if you didn't give a thought to what you wore today. Maxine. Yeah. yeah. One, maybe one and a half. But I thought appearance wasn't that important, or shouldn't be. You're turning up Christians with friends, people who believe in the things that are in the heart that matter. That's what's important. And yet you've all, no doubt, some of you spent a long time thinking about what you're going to wear, getting your hair just right. Strange that, isn't it? Well, I'm here to kind of set the scene about why some of these things are. Why do we put such value on, um, on appearance? Let me, let me give you some facts. This is very interesting. Right. Here we go. By the age of 16, 92% of girls want to change the way they look. By the way, most of these stats are about girls because that's who they tend to focus on. But in my opinion, boys are just as vain. Isn't that right, girls? Yeah. <laughs> 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 glass of water for the person in the back. 90, think about that. 92% of 16-year-old girls want to, ch want to change their appearance. What's this? 98% of women are unhappy with their bodies in some way. You'd have to ask 49 women if they're happy with their body until you came across one who said, yeah, it's fine. 98%. What about this one? By 16, 25%, one in four girls are considering plastic surgery. By the age of 16. 33% of girls between the ages of 8 and 12 want to be slimmer. One in three. Already, there, one in three girls concerned about their weight. The average weight of a celebrity on a magazine cover is 10 to 15% below that which is healthy. They are literally unhealthy. Ten, that's actually a lot. 
Models' legs, on average, they're stretched on the computer by 10%. <laughs> you might not have known that. Nearly every shot you see of a model, her legs will have been stretched. And there you go, she has got nice long legs. That's pretty scary, to be honest. Did you know that many celebrities actually have their own retoucher working full-time for them? I met Sarah Jessica Parker's. They actually have a retoucher. So every photograph that's professionally taken of them, apart from the paparazzi shots, they say, you can take it, but you have to send it to him to retouch. Do you know that the Beckhams, when they're photographed, again, properly, you know, on a proper shoot, it's part of the uh, photographer's contract. He has to shoot it digitally. So they can check straight away, see if there's any shots of them blinking. And if there are, they can delete them because they wouldn't like a shot of them to leak out where they were blinking. Kate Winslet, about a year or two ago, was in GQ, and she was lauded at first because she said, you know, I'm, I'm the shape I am, and I'm the weight I am, and Hollywood's got to accept it. I'm, you know, I'm me, I'm real, and, and this is what I stand up for. And everyone said, right on. And then someone noticed that in one of the photos, it's very strange, because there was Kate, and she was kind of in this jumbled room, and right in the back of the room was a mirror, full length. And the shape of her in the mirror was different to the shape of her, actually. And the retouchers had retouched her, slimmed her down, got rid of some wrinkles and things like that, and forgotten to do the mirror. <laughs> what about this? Now, here's a lovely lady. We all love Kylie. Isn't she beautiful? Look at that lovely white. White eyes, very healthy, lovely skin. She glows, doesn't she? She glows. She's radiant. Quite daring, quite a risque shot. She looks very good. I hope you can see that all right. Of course, she actually looks like this. That's the original photo. I don't know if you've noticed, but she's wearing a top. <laughs> Let's just go back. There she is. Her eyes, you may not be able to see it. Her eyes are very red. She's got a few moles and a few spots. Most of us have. Her teeth aren't that white. She's got some lines under her armpits. Again, we all have. But strangely, huh, that's the image that they will have shown you. And I, I tell you what, if you've got a pen, write down www. Oh, look at it, you really want to see this one. <laughs> I, I couldn't use this website because um, I'd probably be in breach of something or other. But also, you can't download the photos off them. <laughs> What's the point? Okay, www.fluideffect, all one thing, F L U I D E W -E F E C T. So, fluideffect.com. They're a retouching company, and they've got examples of before and after shots on there and you will be amazed. And if you can find the one of Tom Cruise, I guarantee you will go, no way. <laughs> it's strange, isn't it? I mean, she's still very beautiful. And yet, she don't want you to see that, or they don't want you to see that, they'll sell you that instead. How strange, let's get rid of Kylie. The lengths that people will go to to try and achieve the unachieve, unachievable. People see that, that shot of Kylie retouched. A lot of, a lot of people aspire to that. They want to be like her. They want to be like a similar celebrity. So, and everything is focused. If I can be like, if I could get her skin or her hair. And the lengths people will go to, to be slimmer, to have better hair, to have, to have some hair. You know, all these things. Is anyone here squeamish? Don't look. I had a great job once. They asked me to go and photograph a liposuction operation. Yeah, close your eyes. Right. I don't know how well you can see that. This woman was lovely. She was, an app, she was a lovely woman. She looked like the second of those cartoons. She, we chatted for ages. She was lovely. She wanted to lose some weight. So she paid a number of thousands of pounds. And she went in to see the surgeon. And basically, that's a long metal rod with some holes in the end. It's like a vacuum cleaner. And he shoves it in her stomach, pulls up the fat, and literally goes like that. And if you're really squeamish, see that little red dot there? That's where he went too hard, and it came out the other side. If you're really squeamish, turn away now. 
That's what, that's what it was all for. <laughs> Three or four thousand pounds, I think it was. Fat blood, fat blood. Bit of blood. Thousands of pounds. He went through about eight weeks of severe bruising and pain afterwards. And she was bloated because of the bruising to get rid of that. And I'll tell you what, I saw the after photo and she didn't look that different. <laughs> but people will do that and they will convince themselves it's important. Right, who, who really... This is, a, this is plastic surgery gone wrong. I've got to take that down because it actually upsets me. <laughs> that woman is quite well known because she was, I think, dumped by her husband. So she tried to make herself prettier and then it went wrong. So she tried again and again and again and again. All the time trying to achieve something that basically is unachievable. <coughs> and she ended up looking like that. That's very sad when you think about it. Now, did you know that society's obsession with appearance actually carries on after life? Ready for this? Now, you think this is a Mickey take. I got this in a woman's magazine, which I bought because I had some work in it. <laughs> um, not for the free lipstick. And, um, and I guarantee, I've checked out their website. This is absolutely true. I think one or two of you may have seen this before. Right. Introducing Fisher and Sons Funeral Home luxury range of long-lasting afterlife beauty accessories. We've got wound filler, embalming fluid, or lip lock. I can. I've got descriptions. Which one would you like to hear about? Wound filler, embalming fluid, or lip lock? W wound filler. <laughs> You're a gruesome lot. I guarantee that's the first time ever people in this hall have all gone wound filler. <laughs> Here we go. This is the back of the leaflet. Banish unsightly blemishes caused by exposure to car crashes, stab wounds, and other violent causes of death. In turn, and wound filler helps return damaged skin to its previous perfect condition. This smooth, flesh-coloured cream is specially formulated to give the appearance of actual living tissue. The perfect solution to those funeral day dilemmas. <laughs> Yo, you want... Oh, OK, OK, we'll, we'll do more, we'll do more. Lip lock, perfect perhaps are possible, even for those who have passed away. <laughs> in a term, lip lock is the ideal product for the woman who wants to look her best, even in the afterlife. Our dual benefit gloss guarantees everlasting colour and a smile that sticks. Lips look plumper, fuller and ready for the final kiss of death. Colours include nearly nude, blood red and flesh pink. And finally, embalming fluid, death can leave skin looking tired, pale and worn out. <laughs> You're not kidding. <laughs> but, but, but there's no better way of ensuring a fresh, radiant complexion than in eternum embalming fluid. This hydrating, replenishing lotion helps flesh stay firm and imparts a natural-looking flush to lifeless, dull-looking skin. Clinically proven to delay the signs of decomposition. <laughs> Suitable for skin of any age. Marvellous. Hey? Okay. Uh, <laughs> It's, uh, you ready for this? www.luxurytodiefor.com How extremely obsessed are we? That, I mean, we're laughing at that, and yet someone is making money out of that. People are going out and buying those things. How obsessed are we with appearance that there are some people somewhere going, I'll get some of that. It's very, very strange. And trust me, you won't be worrying about your appearance, or the people who, who have passed away won't be worrying about their appearance at their next waking moment as they stand in front of Christ at the judgment seat. They won't be thinking, what do I look like? They might be thinking, what do I look like on the inside? And when Christ returns, you won't be thinking about what you look like on the outside. You'll be thinking, why don't I look more like him on the inside. Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control, will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. There is no beauty product. 
There are no clothes or hair cut or shampoo or whatever that can make you like that. There is faith, trust, belief in Christ Jesus. There is no product on earth, if it is a product, like that which Christ is offering. Right, we'll fire on. So why do we succumb to this? Well, for a start, someone else has actually decided it. Someone's manipulating you along these lines. You might not know you're being manipulated. Do you know you're being manipulated? You're being groomed? Sometimes you do, sometimes you don't. Um, Firstly, it's very, very appealing to the senses. It's very appealing. That, that people will appeal to your senses. When you go into a supermarket, some people actually, it's true, enter into a, a semi-hypnotic trance. Because things are laid out in such a way that you just go, oh, so many beautiful things. I can eat anything. And people actually, their blinking rate slows down. And they enter into a semi-hypnotic trance because it appeals to the senses. That's why they waft the smell of the bread out of the bakery. That's manipulation. They're manipulating you to go and buy a loaf of bread. In the cinemas, they used to do this. It's illegal now. When, it, when they used to have breaks in films, in the olden days, when they used to have breaks in films, it came up to the break, they might put one frame towards the end of the film, so you wouldn't notice it, but your mind would clock it, of something like a desert. And at the same time, they'd put the temperature up in the cinema by one degree. And you wouldn't really notice it, but all the time thinking, oh, could you really do the drink? And then what do you know? It's the break, and the lady with the drinks came round. That's manipulation. You didn't know about it. Even now, companies, they employ psychologists to get inside your head. Well, if we tell them this or show them that, then this is what they'll do. But sometimes we don't even know it. What about peer pressure? Some people say, I don't succumb to peer pressure. I think that's rubbish. We all do. All of us. And it doesn't matter what age you are, where you come from. We all succumb to peer pressure. There's that amazing story about the scientists who they got ten of them in a row. Very clever scientists. And nine of them had been primed and the last one hadn't. And they said to the first nine, uh, first, uh, first nine of the scientists, they said, uh, what's nine times nine? Which is 81, of course. And yet the first nine had been primed, say 83. And when they got to the one who hadn't been primed and says, what's nine times nine? He knew it was 81. But he said 83 as well. Because he didn't want to look stupid. He didn't want to be the odd one out. Why do you think the crowd shouted, crucify him? Why do you think the crowd all said, crucify him, let Barabbas go free? No one wanted to be the one person who said, but he's, he's Jesus. No one wanted to do that. Another reason we succumb to these things is it's just downright tempting, to be honest. It has its own attraction. Let's have a look at, let's see, Genesis 3. Genesis 3. Right. Now, the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat, tree, uh, eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it, or you will die. You will not surely die, the serpent said. The woman for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be, like, will be open, and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her, to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it. You've probably heard the phrase, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, the pride of life. Now it is 1 John 2. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father. And that's the way it's been from the very beginning. 6,000 years or so ago. It's of the world. The serpent said, you're not going to die. Your life is, you know, it's all right, it'll keep going. And the woman looked and said, oh, oh, that looks like it'd be nice food. And it looks nice as well. It has a lovely appearance. Maybe I'll get some wisdom from it as well. I'll be wiser. And what do you know? 
she had slipped from the things of God into the things of the world. And she was right in the middle of the Garden of Eden. How much easier for you or I? They weren't focusing on God, they were focusing on themselves. The next verse says, The world and its desires pass away, but the man who does the will of God lives forever. The things of this world are temporary. It's not just a verse in the Bible. The things of this world are temporary. It doesn't matter how much Laboratoire Garnier comes out with something with Rejuvenum C in it, or they always make up these things. Now with Ceramide all R. Anything, what's that? They don't know. It's not going to help you live any longer. The things of this world are temporary. But the things of God will live forever. Isn't that what you want to aim for? Isn't that what we should be aiming for? Because you know what? None of this worldly stuff, it's not done for your benefit. It's done basically to make money. The reason they'll try and sell you these clothes or that car or this shampoo or these CDs or this way of living or whatever is not for your good. It's to make money. And we're talking about a lot of money. I have a friend called Jeff. He runs a, well, I'm more of an acquaintance. He runs a second-hand clothes shop in Portobello Market. He's got two little shops now. He sells vintage clothes, quite good vintage clothes. Um, two fashion designers went in there, uh, Dominica and Stefano. They, they, they wanted to do research, so they went to buy some vintage clothes to get ideas for their next, their next line. You might know them best by their surnames, Dolce and Gabbana. And they normally went in, and they would go in every now and then and pay for the privilege. One trip, they went in and bought some second-hand clothes for research for the cost of £100,000. That's a lot of second-hand clothes. And that's for one fashion house, for one collection, and no doubt they went to other shops. And if that's them, expand that now. Think, okay... That's them. What about the whole fashion industry? What about the whole music industry? What about the whole service industry? Automotive industry? Think of all the things that people try and sell you. You are bombarded with things that people want to sell you. How much money are we talking about that's at stake here? I don't suppose you could count it. We're talking about billions upon billions upon billions of pounds. Yeah. Don't do these things for our benefit. It's all there to get a part of that billions of pounds. It's all about money. We know it says, for the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. What's it about for God? That's probably a little bit more important. What it is, what is it about for God? I love this verse. I keep on coming back to it. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. It is one of the most powerful and comforting and at the same time difficult to get your head round verses in the Bible. I think that's why I keep coming back to it, partly for comfort and partly to try and get my head round it. And yet this is about your spiritual good. It's not about your worldly good. It's not that you'll get the grades you need, or the friends you want, or the clothes you want, or something like that. It's about getting you to the kingdom. Because God's overriding concern for every single one of us in this room, every single one of us, God's overriding concern as he looks down on each one of you and on me, is that we should get to the kingdom. To God, there is nothing more important than that. He even gave his son to try and make that happen. How important is it to God that you get to the kingdom? And he's saying, I will do everything I can. I'll give my son. And I, there's only a few parents here, but trust me, there is nothing, I don't think, I don't think there's anything bigger than giving your child. I wouldn't do it. I'm sorry, but I wouldn't do it for you. And God did it. And then it says he carried on giving. And 
And what he says is, if you focus on me, not on these worldly temporary things, if you focus on me, I will really focus on you. And I will try and structure everything to get you to the kingdom. Because once you're at the kingdom, oh, none of that stuff matters. I just want you to get there. And that's the difference. With society, really it's about money. With God, it's about love. Now, if we're susceptible to these things outside the meeting, outside the meeting, out, outside our Christian lives, if they should be outside, why do we think it's any different, say, when we get together like this? Or on a Sunday, or a Friday, or whenever you get together? Why do we think it's any different then? I, I, I know a girl, daughter of Christadelphians. She wears quite a lot of makeup. She has a makeup bag she carries around her. She goes to my wife, Beck. She says, really like the skirt you're wearing, Beck. It really suits you. Beck goes, oh, thanks. I like that colour as well. It goes with your hair. And Beck goes, well, of course the colour's right. I went to all College of Art. And then you look at this girl. She's four. Four, and she is obsessed with appearance. Daughter of Christadelphians. What about other types of appearance? I think sometimes we're a bit more susceptible to these things. Such regulations indeed have an appearance of wisdom with their self-imposed worship, their false humility and their harsh treatment of the body, but they lack any value in restraining sensual indulgence. Galatians 2 verse 6, as for those who seem to be important, whatever they were makes no difference to me. God does not judge by external appearances. Those men added nothing to my message. If you're not susceptible to appearance, maybe sometimes we're susceptible to the appearance of wisdom, the appearance of power, the appearance of importance. Because we all like to be associated with people like that, don't we? I'm with him. That kind of thing. And I tell you what, I think that is true the older you get. As I get older, believe it or not, I care less and less about my appearance because I realise there's no hope, to be honest. <laughs> but I am well aware, and I prayed about it on the way up, that actually I get more and more susceptible to these things. And yet these things are easy to forget. The appearance of wisdom, the appearance of importance. I'll be very quick because I know that time is upon us, as they say. When I, I used to teach at University of Central England, I set up a staff and second third year BA against first year BA football match. And, uh, and well, I, got, I got the team together pretty quick. And, um, and then this uh, Tom Willie, who some of you know, came and said, I've got a friend, Mark, he's in uh, BA too, wants to know if he can have a game. I said, well, teams are kind of full, you know. But he brought Mark along anyway. Guy kind of came, yeah, hi, hi. Yeah, I just wanted this, this spot for me. No, sorry, the, sorry, the teams are full. I may, I may come on at the end, five minutes. I mean, you know, who is this guy? He goes, oh, it's just I used to play a bit, uh, you know, in the Nottingham Forest youth team. <laughs> this was a while back when Nottingham Forest were slightly better than they are now. I said, sorry, what do you say? No, no, I used to play in the Nottingham Forest youth team. Had trials and things. You're in the team. <laughs> You're at the team. <laughs> and I tell you what, when it came to the match, obviously I was goal hanging at one end, and down the other end they, they crossed the ball into our defence, and everyone's kind of standing there because no one wants to head it in case they, their head gets hurt, you know, and they're all standing there. And suddenly, from out of nowhere, this guy Mark appeared, transformed into this kind of six foot four blonde Adonis Aryan type. And he fl literally, it, it all happened in slow motion. It was wonderful to see. <laughs> you know, everyone's head's there, and he kind of rose up like this, flew through the air. And as he, this is absolutely true, as he flew, well, apart from the slow motion, but as he flew through the air, he shouted, because his name was, surname was Fensom, he shouted, Fensom's ball! And they were, uh, and he went, Bang! And it was one of those slow motion where the like, ball exploded off his head, rocked it down the other end. Even when he landed, he landed like this. <laughs> the guy was amazing. He was by a mile the best footballer on the pitch. And yet because of things like this, I think, 
And because of the fact he was like this and kind of spoke a bit like this, I didn't want to know him. Actually, I didn't want to know him after the match because we lost 14-1. But <laughs> it wasn't Mark's fault. We're all susceptible to things like this, whether we know it or not. I must fly on. Oh. You know, concern about the way you appear inevitably affects the way you relate to those around you, as it did my relation with this guy, Mark. Inevitably affects it. If you're concerned about the way you appear, or critical, or harsh, or whatever, or obsessed, then inevitably you are the same with those around you. If you judge yourself harshly, surely you will start judging, well, look what he's wearing or she's wearing, or, oh, well, you know what they're like, and you start judging them in the same way. It's inevitable, because those are the values you live by. Effectively, if you're trying to live a lie, you might say, then inevitably it will affect those around you. If you're trying to follow after a lie. I, I used to know a fantastic liar. Well, actually, he wasn't fantastic because no one believed him. But his name, name was Johnny. I won't say not you, Johnny, or you, Johnny, or anyone else they called Johnny. But I went to school with him. And he was actually a useless liar, but he used to come out with some absolute crackers. Um, for example, the, the Queen had sent him a letter giving him special permission to drive under the age of 17. <laughs> I think it culminated with his... Um, that he came in one day and said he'd just beaten up a ninja. Now, what a ninja was doing in King's Heath, I've got no idea. Ninja, if you don't know, ninja is kind of the ultimate Japanese warrior assassin type. Johnny was about this tall. <laughs> and the strange thing was, he didn't have any friends. No one was friends with Johnny. Why would he want to be with someone who isn't being honest with you? Would you want to be friends with someone who you knew wasn't honest with you? I love this proverb. Proverbs 27, verse 6. Wounds from a friend can be trusted, but an enemy multiplies kisses. Wounds from a friend. If a friend says to you, look, actually, I disagree with what you've done or whatever, you know you can trust them. They're a friend. They're being honest. An enemy multiplies kisses. And that's what society does. Oh, you're the only one who counts. You know, look after number one, because you're the most important, because you're worth it. Yes, you look... Ima imagine hanging around with someone who just constantly said, you know, you look great today. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah, you look absolutely brilliant. The best, the most handsome person I've ever met. Oh, well, if you're sure. Yeah, yeah. By the way, that joke you said yesterday was the funniest joke I've ever heard. Was it? Yeah. Oh, and um, can I hang around with you all day, because you're the best company? And by the way, everyone likes you. In fact, I want to model my life on yours. Really? Shut up. You could, be the, you could be the greatest. Whatever you put your mind to, you'll be the greatest. You can tell them to sling their hook. An enemy multiplies kisses. That's exactly what society does. Come on, you, you're the important one. You're great. You can achieve whatever you want to achieve. You can do whatever you want. You, you want to look like Carly? You can look like Carly if you spend some money. But wounds from a friend can be trusted. Your best friends, your real... Think about your best friends. Are you thinking about your best friends? Are they the most physically attractive people you know? Corin looked at Dan there. <laughs> <laughs> Wounds from a friend can be trusted. Why do you love your mom and dad? Are they the most physically attractive people you know? If you've got brothers or sisters, or like me, you've got kids. Are they the most physically attractive people I know? No. <laughs> but why do we love them why do you love your mom and dad we love their mom and dad because they loved us first look what it says about God we love because he, God, first loved us he loved us first so shouldn't we return the compliment if you like this is love, not that we love God but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. God loved us first. And he just says, I, Joe, I don't care, you know, that you're losing it a bit there. I don't care that, you know, you've got heartburn or that your back aches. He says, those things are important. I don't even care that you're wearing a dodgy pair of socks. He says, Joe, I loved you first. 
and I gave you my son. And there is no love greater than that. Shouldn't it be God we're looking to have a relationship with who has loved us from the day we were born? When you were born, God didn't say, I don't really care about you yet. I'll wait for you to grow up a bit. God loved you from the day you were born. That's the kind of person I'd like a relationship with. But to do that, we've got to be honest. Right, very quick. Luke 15, the young one, parable of the prodigal son. I'll be very quick. The young one said to his father, you know this story very well, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country. He began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired men have food to spare? And here I am, starved to death. I'll set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. Very interesting, that. Relationships, they say, are based in honesty. In the King James Version, the bit there highlighted, verse 17, came to his senses, is, I mean, that meaning is right, but it's a more literal translation. It's a better one. It says, when he came to himself. You have to come to yourself first and recognise your shortcomings. Be honest with yourself. Recognise the need for God, and then you can return to the Father. Relationships are based on honesty. God has been desperately honest with us when you think about it. He said, right, this is the way things are. This is what's happened. This is what will happen. This is what I'm doing in your life. This is what I've given. This is what I'd like. And if you do it, I'll give you this fantastic reward. You can't really be much more honest than that. And God asks us to be honest in return. to come to our senses to come to ourselves, and then return to God and it's a lot easier to see things when you see things completely differently you'll see things completely differently when you recognise that people are trying to groom you trying to manipulate you once you recognise these aren't the things to be chasing after the things of God are the things to chase after when you recognise how desperate people are to, for you to fall into that trap I'm going to skip this, and I want to show you something. I went out and bought this magazine, much to my shame, with a bag over my head, from my shop, local shopkeeper, JD, yesterday. It was, it's called Sugar, but it, you can't see because it says, Free Metallic Belt, this season's must-have accessory. Guys, <laughs> here it is. I haven't opened it, so I want to take it back to this. I'm guessing it's rubbish. Um, I want to take it back to JD and get my money back. Sugar, it's called. Right. 14 real lives, including the fabulous story, A Tiger Ate My Leg. Uh, she bullied me, now I love her. Uh, instant glamour, what else we got? Cheap, no streaks, tan. Pull him in six killer moves. Become the ultimate lab nadding, lab, lad nabbing babe. Group or gang, which one are you in? It's riveting. Christina reveals her top 10 sexy secrets and it comes free with a sugar lad mag it's all about him for you all your questions get answered boys get x-rated inside it says hey, just see that there boys get x-rated inside marvellous sugar that is and very interesting I didn't notice this until after I bought it you can't quite see it there but it says on that lad mag your free supersize boy Bible. Which Bible do you want to focus on? That or this one? One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God? He said, since you're under the same sentence, we're punished justly for we're getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. And then he said, as we all should say, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, I tell you the truth today, you will be with me in paradise. It was now about the sixth hour, and darkness came over the whole land until the ninth hour, for the sun stopped shining, 
and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And when he said this, he breathed his last. Now you tell me, which Bible do you want to follow? You tell me, which one do you want to hold on to? Tell me which one you want a relationship with. When you see it like that, to be honest, when we come to our senses, it's probably one of the easiest decisions we'll ever make. Thank you for listening to the Good Christadelphian Talks podcast. Please subscribe for new episodes and leave a review on Apple Podcasts or whichever service you are listening from to help people find the show when they search for it. If you enjoyed this talk, share it on social media so other people can find it too. For show notes and links to the talk that you just listened to, visit our show page at anchor.fm slash gct. We want to encourage everyone to share their thoughts from the talk this week on Facebook or Instagram, where we are at Good Christadelphian Talks or on Twitter, where we are at GCT underscore podcast. If you know of a great talk, we want to know about it too. Send a suggestion to goodchristadelphiantalks at gmail.com or message us on any of our social media platforms. Thank you for listening. God bless and talk to you next week.